Hi, welcome to today's webinar, Systems Engineering in Turbulent Times. My name is Eva Dace and I'm a member of the Marketing Department here at Vitec. I will be your host during today's webinar, which is being presented by David Long. For over 20 years, David has focused on enabling, applying, and advancing model-based systems engineering to help transform the state of the systems engineering practice. He's the founder and president of Vitec Corporation, where he developed and commercialized CORE. A committed member of the worldwide systems community, David is president-elect of INCOSI. He is a frequent presenter at industry events worldwide, delivering keynotes and tutorials spanning introductory systems engineering, the advanced application of MBSE, and the future of systems engineering. His experiences and efforts led him to co-author the book, A Primer for Model-Based Systems Engineering, to help spread the fundamental concepts of this key approach to modern challenges. Now, before we get started, I need to review a few housekeeping matters. Please take a few moments now to get comfortable with your webinar control panel, as this is how you will be able to submit your questions throughout the presentation. We will address questions at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned. Next, I'd like to answer our most asked question. This webinar is being recorded. You will be able to find a recording in the webinar archive in the resources section of our website within the next 24 hours. Let me chat out the link to you now so you will find it in your chat window. There it is. So now let me hand it over to our presenter. Welcome, David. It's really great to have you with us. Eva, thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction and for all the logistics details. And thank you for everyone who's taking time out of their day to, to join us. You know, may you live in, in interesting times, the so-called Chinese curves. I'll have to tell you that today is far more than interesting. We have new challenges emerging. Technology is dynamic. Budgets, I think the only thing we can say there is they're shrinking. And our response time is limited. The time between when an opportunity or a challenge arises and when we need to uh, field a system, field a solution to meet that challenge is tighter than ever. So really, it's beyond interesting. In fact, it's beyond dynamic. The best word I can find is, is turbulent. So in this ever-changing world, what role does systems engineering play? If we get a hold of the proverbial tiger, how do we do more than simply hold on for dear life? How do we evolve? How do we deliver value? And how do we as systems engineers thrive? Those are the questions I, I hope to answer today as we talk about systems engineering in turbulent times. It's going to be a fast-paced journey. I want to highlight challenges that exist in our current environment from a systems perspective, expose a few opportunities, suggest some tactics that we can use as uh, individuals and as a profession to address that, and, well, if you know me, perhaps even create a little controversy. So with that intro, let's go ahead and get going. Systems engineering truly emerged from the development of large standalone single purpose systems. Whether you want to trace our heritage to early telecommunication systems or early military aerospace systems, that statement is true. Large standalone single purpose systems. That's not the story today. Today we face an ever shifting landscape and we're asked to operate across a very wide range. We're asked to operate across a wide range of scale, large problems and small, cost, highly expensive systems and relatively inexpensive, and product lifespans. We have the next generation Australian submarine with a concept to final retirement lifespan of a, of a century, 100 years. We've got a next generation phone, which the time that model is in the stores, if it's a year, you're lucky these days. We've got smart vehicles operating at home on our roads, driverless vehicles, and we've got them millions of miles away. We're dealing with our traditional domains, but we're dealing with new domains, new regulations, new concerns. The only constant across all this is change and the ever accelerating pace of that change. You know, I guess what they say on the Big Bang Theory is true. Bluetooth does make everything else better. We can talk about aerospace, 
uh, systems these days and, and the wide range of sensors, electronic control units, millions of lines of code and messages. Uh, the analog that's typically used then is, is cars, you know, the X generation cars and the software that exists in those control systems. But it goes far beyond that. Uh, this graphic from an Encozy Model Based Systems Engineering Initiative highlights the washer and dryer and the amount of technology in there, the sensors, the information technology, and now the wireless technology. Complexity is, is more than just electronics. It is everywhere we look. I, I believe firmly that the systems engineering perspective helps us see the big picture and manage those complex interactions between the interacting subsystems. If you lack the systems view, you have a high risk of failure, and that's why systems engineering came about in the first place in the aerospace business. You can't afford for an airplane to fail in flight, uh, but as noted here, systems engineering and complexity is far more than planes these days, and failures, whether it's in a plane, in a vehicle line, or the washing machine at home, is, is costly and brand damaging to say the very least. But complexity has multiple dimensions, and our appreciation of what complexity is continues to change. There's certainly detailed complexity. This is what we understand the best. That's created by a large number of elements or aspects of a problem, the interoperations of those pieces. What we're starting to appreciate far more is dynamic complexity which arises from the intricacy of interactions and the fluidity of those interactions over time within the system and beyond the system boundary. Without a systems view, it's really impossible to anticipate the course of actions as the system begins to function and interact. Dynamic uh, complexity of the system and the system within its environment. We're making progress here. We, we appreciate that complexity. We've moved from problems as simplistic to problems as disorganized complexity, and eventually problems as organized complexity. But the bottom line here is complexity continues to grow. And as complexity grows, sadly enough, budgets continue to shrink. If you live in the U.S., particularly in the U.S. military and aerospace market, you're certainly familiar with sequestration. Uh, that hammer that the government designed to force us to come to budget agreements and make an intelligent choice because clearly no one would allow sequestration to occur. Well, sadly, what we forecast is un impossible came to pass. And so this sequestration is in place as a hammer on our budget across the board, uh, across the board cuts. We're not alone in the U.S. Uh, we do a lot of work with Australia. Australia ran into a challenge where the elected party that was in government had made a commitment to balance the budget before they left office. Well, as they got up to the deadline, they realized they were several percentage points short, and they made radical changes in one year to balance their budget. The challenge here isn't just the shrinking budget. It's budget uncertainty. And budget uncertainty requires replanning and re-replanning in many efforts that go beyond delivering value. Again, it implies an absence of the system perspective and life cycle understanding. It's something that we can't control. It's another aspect of turbulence in today's environment. And one more challenge. Our problem space continues to shift. Uh, even if you look within the military aerospace domain, we're now in the world of, of terrorism and asymmetric warfare. This picture obviously from the Boston Marathon bombing in mid-April of this year. But even as challenges emerge, so do new technologies and new opportunities. From that same event, crowdsourcing and the identification of suspects. And this photo uh, in blue, unfortunately, is a young boy who lost his life. In red is crowdsourced photo from of the bomber and of the backpack. So as the challenges grow, so does the solution space and so do new technologies. Not only do we have new technologies, they're accelerating technologies. 
The old story is that the phone that you carry on your hip, the calculator that you have in your pocket, has more computing power than we use to put man on the moon. Well, it's better than that or worse than that, depending on your frame of reference. The recordable greeting cards that you can buy from Hallmark today have more computing power and memory, and certainly at a lot less cost than the Apollo guidance computer that put a man on the moon. So this technology is accelerating at a tremendous rate, which opens up new opportunities to counteract those challenges. Disruptive technologies. You can take your choice of disruptive technologies that are coming along, which will mature, which will come into full being. Here's 3D printing and the concept of a uh, sample race car that's actually a fully 3D printed vehicle, the chassis, etc. So the introduction of disruptive technologies, it's power that helps us combat these challenges, address these challenges, but again, it's disruption. And so the bottom line is we live in a time of turbulence. If we look at our domain, the divergence of lifetimes from months to a century, varied scale of problems, varied domains to work in, medical, military, aerospace, uh, socio-economic, you name it. We're moving from a green field, blue sky design of new systems into a world of integration and reconfiguration for new capabilities. Maybe it's commercial off the shelf, maybe it's government off the shelf, maybe it's simple reuse, but an increasing emphasis on that integration to deliver new value from existing pieces. And then the, the systems themselves are evolving. That driverless vehicle is smart. We've got adaptive systems. We've got chaotic systems. If you look beyond the systems engineering domain, we live in an overall era of evolution. We see the influences of new technologies, biotechnology, swarm theory, uh, agent, independent agents, etc. Look on a grander scale and you can begin to see signs of national specialization, nations deciding that they can bring greater value by operating cohesively in a particular area of focus. And through this all, you have opportunities emerge to leapfrog. We certainly see that in new organizations, that new start that is able to do things that the established large organization can't do because they don't have the processes and bureaucracy and infrastructure. You can even see it on a national scale. Uh, countries where they can deploy wireless technologies versus having to sustain an existing infrastructure. So we have wonderful opportunities through the introduction of these technologies. And again, rapid change that is far beyond our sphere of control. Our problems are changing. Our solution technologies are changing. Uh, the constraints around us, the budgets and the schedules are certainly changing. So that's where we live today as systems engineers. Uh, you can fight it, you can embrace it, but the reality is it is. So the question to us is how do we as systems engineers adjust, adapt, and ultimately excel in this time of turbulence? I'd like to give fundamentally six uh, strategies, six tactics that I think will help us as we enter this era and age, an age where I do believe that uh, the constant is the ever accelerating pace of change. We'll do this as a series of, of six steps. And you should always start with a solid foundation. And that's a blessing for us. We have a wonderful foundation. We're not new to this problem. We're not new to change. We're not new to complexity. We're not new to new technologies. The shape is shifting. The details are different. But fundamentally, systems engineering largely emerged to address the types of challenges that we're facing today. The shape is a little bit different, but the fundamental character is the same. If we're not careful, if we overreact to the situation, we can actually do great damage. We can add to this turbulence. We can add to the chaos. Instead, if we build on our foundation, embrace what is strong, and adjust and adapt, we can do even better. We've spent 60 years developing this. 
much of the progress has actually come in the last decade, we can look at harmonization between the ENCOSI Systems Engineering Handbook, ISO 15288. We have a common language with which to speak. Within the last two years, the CBOC, the Systems Engineering Body of Knowledge, has come online. We have programs such as certification. These are all foundational pieces that we can build upon. So what's in that foundation? Well, as systems engineers, obviously we should draw from the Systems Engineering Foundation. As Incozi's president-elect, I like to joke that if I don't work in a definition of systems or systems engineering in every presentation, they'll probably throw me out of office. So here's the Incozi definition of systems engineering, which we're all familiar with. But those words that are bolded at the end, high quality, trustworthy, cost efficient, scheduled compliant across the entire life cycle, these are words that stress how systems engineering has been and needs to continue to be focused on these challenges that we face today. It's more than just systems engineering. I'll tell you that it's also systems theory. So systems theory is that overall interdisciplinary study of systems. Sometimes we get obsessed with the engineering aspect of our label. Sometimes we are obsessed with mathematical foundations, et cetera. It's not that that's not important, but there's more than systems engineering. We need those systems concepts and elucidate those principles that can be applied across the board. So systems engineering and systems theory, well, there's another dimension as well, and that's system science. System science is that interdisciplinary field to study the nature of complex systems. It is natural systems, it's society, it's science itself. And one more, it's systems thinking. The systems thinking uh, quote here is from Russell Ackoff, who's actually, or was actually a business professor, uh, University of Pennsylvania, I believe. But it's this holistic perspective. It's one of the things that fundamentally differentiates us as systems engineers. Uh, it's understanding the whole, you know, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So often in Western education, we are taught decompositional approaches, continue to break the problem down, get uh, further and further specialized, understand the, the small aspect. That decompositional thinking is very, very important and very valuable. What we often lose perspective of, lose sight of as systems engineers is this systems thinking, this systems view that we so naturally take is not one that's always embraced and understood and even seen by others. So systems thinking is a key part of what we need to do and what we need to build upon. So if step one is leveraging our foundation, let's remember we do have 60 years of practice. We don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now it's not all 100% applicable. It can be tuned. We can make it more efficient and we have to be more efficient. We can make it more effective and we have to be more effective to face these challenging problems. Some of the things that we need to do are establish robust, resilient, and holistic architectures. For example, you can't simply bolt on security after the fact. We need to incorporate security into our mental model. We need to incorporate many of these domain perspectives into our fundamental architecture. We need to stop trying to freeze requirements. Uh, we need to embrace the change. We need to embrace it in the requirements. We need to embrace it in the technologies in order to have long-lived products or at least long-lived product families. And we need to look beyond the requirements. We need to look up into the problem space. We need to apply our practice and skills there. Too often, we attempt to solve symptoms of the problem. What customers communicate to us is the requirements because those are the observables. We have to use techniques such as the five whys to ask why is it that you believe you need that? Why do you think that's important? Not to be disrespectful, but to bring our value and our perspective into the problem domain 
so that we can better frame the problem and better solve it. The most costly errors are still made on day one of a project, still true today. And then we need to innovate. Jim Collins has a wonderful quote, I believe, from 2011, where he, start, he began advocating, ask who, not how. Rather than asking, how do I solve this problem, ask who has solved it before. It may be somebody in my systems domain, and I can take that systems uh, approach and apply it, that pattern, and apply it to my solution. It may be somebody in the biologic domain has faced a similar problem and has brought a problem that uh, uh, brought a solution that I can learn from. So ask who, not how, to better innovate. And Henri Poincar commented that uh, creation consists of making new com combinations. Drawing elements from domains which are far apart often lead to new innovations. That, in fact, is true of the Gutenberg printing press. The fundamentals of Gutenberg's printing press were known, but they were separate. Gutenberg's true innovation and contribution was drawing from disparate fields and assembling a new combination to truly innovate. So building upon our practice, tuning our practice, and applying some fundamental innovation, that's how we can leverage our foundation. So step two, embrace the lessons from Lean. For those who have not seen it, uh, the Guide to Lean Enablers for Managing Engineering Programs, this was a guide published uh, primarily by the Lean Aerospace Initiative out of MIT. It was co-sponsored or jointly developed with uh, Project Management Institute in NCOSI. You can access this on the web. If you're interested after the fact, uh, let me know and I'll make sure we get you a link. This is a highly valuable reference. And it is a wonderful story of how we can learn lessons from Lean, lessons that apply to leading engineering programs, and I think advancing the cause of systems engineering. So why do you want to act? One of the great things about this study is there are some clear uh, indicators from their study that show correlation between good programs and good practices and bad programs and bad practices. Uh, you know, the graph here in the lower corner shows cost increase. If you look at the largest 96 acquisition programs as of the time of this study, the engineering cost was running a little bit of above 40% over budget. Total cost increase of those programs was about 25% over budget. And we can certainly point to programs where it's far, far worse than that. If you look in the upper right, uh, you'll note the difference between dark blue which are successful programs, and the kind of greenish bars, the less successful programs. Those successful that are those programs that are deploying successful practices, which they elucidate in that in the document, meet the targets plus or minus 10 percent. They're in the ballpark. The others fail to meet the targets fundamentally across the board. And the the lessons that they're drawing out in this guide all revolve around lean. Lean is centered around value, which is making sure that you're focused on the measure of worth, and it's worth is what the customer says it is. Value is what the customer is after. So you're trying to maximize value at the same time you're trying to minimize waste. And it's a very simple definition of waste. It's any work element that doesn't directly add value to the product or service in the eyes of the customer. So how do we learn from that? Well, the document includes approximately 300 best practices. They're in 43 categories. They're organized into six overall themes. As the authors say, hey, look, these are all good sense. There's nothing in the document that will shock you or I. But as the authors say, let's strive to make them common sense. So it's a document worth reviewing, but I, I've chosen five here from this that I think we can particularly leverage and, and use as systems engineering, highlighting the key phrases in blue. So eliminate non-value added elements. What's non-value added in systems engineering? Well, maybe it's an artifact that's appropriate on another program that's part of a corporate process but isn't 
key for this particular project, this key, this particular customer base. In other words, the universal application of, uh, of say, documentation standards or whatnot, in some cases it can be a good thing. In some cases, according to Lean, it can be wasted. Ensure upfront that the capabilities exist. Do we have the capabilities within the development organization? Are the technologies that we're going to use of sufficient technology readiness level? Again, a basic principle for us, but a good reminder. Uh, use systems engineering to coordinate and integrate. I think we can all appreciate that. Reject non-value items as waste. Okay, focus on what the customer need is and working to deliver that need. There are a lot of places that we can get lost in the systems engineering process. They can slow us down. Uh, they can, you know, add costs, et cetera. And again, as systems engineers, I think we understand the criticality of communication, coordination, and collaboration. Earlier I said one of the things that distinguishes our profession is the systems viewpoint, the holistic perspective. I think another thing that fundamentally distinguishes us is our ability and in fact our requirement to connect to a very diverse population. We're not the leaders of programs oftentimes, but we often sit at the hub of coordination, communicating with customers, users, project managers, domain specialists, other systems engineers. And so through communication, coordination, and collaboration, we can improve the execution of processes and better bring, uh, better realize systems that deliver customer value. The additional point that this uh, guide to lean enablers brings is we can improve overall performance if we will integrate program management and systems engineering. Now this isn't to say every program manager should be a systems engineer, nor is it to say every systems engineer should be a program manager, but it's to call out the synergy. Both of us are focused on delivering success for the customer, delivering a greater solution. Some people would say this is keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. Hopefully we don't view the world of program managers and systems engineers that way. It's a, it's a nice joke, but hopefully little more. Instead, what we need to do is ensure that the manager who is ultimately responsible for the execution of that project has the authority, they're held accountable for the success of the program, they have a strong understanding of both program management and systems engineering disciplines. That is key to delivering success. So some quick lessons from Lean to build upon that foundation. Those of you who are interested, there certainly is a field called Lean Systems Engineering, and in fact, Nkosi has a Lean SE working group. So build on our foundation, incorporate the lessons of Lean. Next, incorporate the insights of Agile. Agile is certainly the latest uh, you can call it a methodology, you can call it a craze. It depends upon which side of the fence you fall on. It is certainly a very strong methodology in the software domain. There are often questions about it in the systems domain. What can we leverage from Agile? Where can we draw value in facing these turbulent times? Well, let's start by understanding where we come from. I always like to show the old waterfall model. Okay, where you start with requirements, you complete your requirements, you throw it over the wall, then you do your design, you throw it over the wall to the next group, you do implementation. You throw it over to the wall to the uh, test guys because you know nobody really likes to deal with the test guys, they're a little odd. Well, we think that we left waterfall behind years ago. Everybody will agree that this is not the optimum process for responding to challenges particularly challenges where technologies are changing and requirements are changing. That said, most organizations I look at show legacy remnants of the waterfall, and that's stove piping of groups. You can find a requirements group that is separate from an architecture group, that is separate from a test and evaluation group. And we might have our reasons for this, but the reality is that waterfall mentality is still embodied 
in many of our organizational principles, whether we like it or not. The result is, is data loss as we try to communicate. It is perspective loss. We're like the three blind men trying to describe the elephant. One grabs the tail, thinks he has a rope. One steps to the side, feels like he has a, uh, a solid wall. One steps to the trunk and describes it as a snake, but no one person has the full perspective. And isn't that what systems engineering is all about? It's about integration. It's about breadth across the analysis and solution space rather than stovepiping those aspects. We need to break down these stovepipes. If we can't do it organizationally, then we need to do it process-wise. So what can we draw from Agile? What can we do that will help? Well, I won't look at the Agile manifesto itself, but instead I'm going to draw 12 aspects out of the Incozy Systems Engineering Handbook version 3.2. These were developed by the Agile Systems Engineering Working Group within Incozy. The ones that I think are particularly notable here, dealing with these challenges that we face, is the focus on early and continuous delivery. Effectively, go back to lean. We're trying to ensure we deliver value. We're also, if you follow V, trying to achieve early validation and customer verification. So early and continuous delivery, I do believe, is a lesson that we can learn. Now, it's different when you're bending metal than when you're writing code, but we can try to figure out a way to deliver artifacts that ensure that we remain on path throughout the systems development process. Welcome, require, welcome changing requirements. Build architectures that are resilient and robust and can adjust to these. Set up processes that are resilient, robust, and can adjust to these. The reality is that we will not stop change. We won't stop it in the technologies, and we certainly won't stop it in the requirements. So let's make sure that we are adapting our process to accommodate this. Develop working software and other system elements frequently. Okay? Continuously deliver validated pieces. If you're dealing with model-based systems engineering, this may be working models to prove that things are working. Uh, in a software domain, obviously, it's pretty easy to, to turn the code, build, ensure that it works, et cetera. But rather than waiting for the big bang at the end and the miraculous delivery, develop working pieces throughout. Working software is the primary measure of progress. It's not hours expended. It's not dollars expended. It's not days work to completion. It's not even specifications. It is working artifacts should be our primary measure to ensure that we're continuing to deliver value and we're on track. Technical, ex sorry, technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Agility allows you to handle changing requirements. It also helps you uh, respond to new challenges and integration over time. And simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. You'll notice the synergy here. Agile and lean and many other things are drawing from the same concepts. We may state them in different ways, but maximizing the amount of work not done is the same as minimizing waste in lean. And we have limited time and budget. Let's make sure that we do things that lead to the solution. Step one is our foundation. Step two, learn from lean. Step three, draw insights from agile. Step four, well, this is one that we live in every day at Vitech. Okay, Vitech was model-based systems engineering before model-based systems engineering was cool. And certainly, our practice is transforming through the application of model-based systems engineering. Uh, the heritage here goes back many years. I can point at least 40 years back. The disciplined transformation of our practice dates back to about 2005, 2007. And that's the stage that we live in now. It's a generational change, but it's enabling multidisciplinary integration. This is the classic and cozy chart for those who've seen it before, for those who haven't. This is an example to cast a vision. What if we had integration in a true model-based systems engineering model that connected to lower level models? We had a car. We had a requirement about braking radius, turning radius, braking distance. 
we needed to make a change. How does that propagate through all the models, thermodynamic models, electrical models, control models, et cetera? The key here for me is model-based systems engineering is about transforming our practice. Systems engineering is really the last major engineering discipline to make the leap to models. But MBSE itself isn't a disruptive technology. It's a game changer for us. It's transformative to our practice, but not an end unto itself. I think the greatest transformation, the greatest contribution of MBSE is as an enabler to model-based engineering. That may be our ultimate disruptive technology. If we can truly connect the model life cycle from beginning to end, the product life cycle through integrated models, we can truly accelerate the time to market. We can be more responsive and resilient to change across the life cycle. Certainly, we can reduce defects as we pass models and connect models in an automated way throughout the life. And uh, throughout it all, we can reduce cost. We can avoid re-engineering of artifacts. Uh, we can optimize systems for direct delivery, et cetera. There are many things that we're doing here. Uh, we can set and are setting a model-based foundation for research and innovation. You can look at the INCOSI model-based working group. Uh, the model-based workshop is part of the INCOSI International Workshop every January. You can see a great deal of research. Uh, the Systems Engineering Research Center, which is led by Stevens, but is a consortium of 20-some universities in the US, does far more than model-based systems engineering research, but it is certainly a key tenet, a key thrust in their areas, DARPA meta program, you name it. And there are dimensions both for us, the practitioners, things that help us do our job better, but also things for our customers that allow us to deliver higher value. These research cycles right now are enabling cycles of divergent thinking, allowing us to try new ideas as we transform our practice, and then convergent thinking as we align and refine and get in registration so that we can adopt standards. Model-based uh, is necessary. Several years ago, Sandy Friedenthal was asked, do you think we'll make the leap to model-based? And his answer was, I sure hope so. If we don't, we're going to be out of business. The complexity of our challenges, the complexity of our environment is so great that if we don't transform our practice through this way, we won't be able to keep up. So model-based is a critical enabler to me alongside Agile, alongside Lean, and alongside our, our foundations. Through it all, we have to begin with the end in mind. What do I mean by that? Well, in a document-driven systems engineering process, it's quite frequent that the document becomes the focus. People begin to engineer the specification rather than the system because the specification is the deliverable. Well, if we're in transformation of our practice to model-based, does the model take precedent over the system? Do we fall into the same trap? Do we accidentally settle for diagram-based, sorry, diagram-based systems engineering, which is perhaps even more dangerous than document-based? We can't fall in love with our tools, okay? Building the model isn't what it's all about. Exercising the model to learn is important. The purpose of systems engineering is not the specification. The purpose of systems engineering is not the model. The purpose actually isn't even the system of interest. The purpose is delivering the required value to the customer and to the stakeholders. So to begin with the end in mind, I believe that we need less pose and more rows. We need less process-oriented systems engineering and more results-oriented systems engineering. That's not a statement that process is bad. Process is actually absolutely essential. But process has to be an enabler, not an end unto itself. Again, this should sound familiar. It's in harmony with the lessons of Lean. It's in harmony with some of the applications of Agile. What does this really mean in practice? Well, there's an old quote from a 
from a colleague I've, I've known for oh, probably 20 years now. Jack Ring has a very famous quote that said, doors is the worst thing that's ever happened to systems engineering. Now Jack's comment is often misunderstood and misinterpreted. It's not about doors itself. It's not about software in general. It's about the shift in focus from systems engineering to requirements management. From delivering a capability to the customer to just bookkeeping and requirements regurgitation. Those things are absolutely necessary, but they're not sufficient. We need the process standards. We need representation and interchange standards. We need frameworks, but we don't need to be slave to them. We need these to serve us rather than we serve them. As always, it's about balance. balance. The bookkeeping of systems engineering, the perspiration of our job, and the creativity, the holistic thought, the integration, those two things have to be kept aligned. We need new ideas. We need standards based upon proven success. And again, going back to the research that's going on today, we need cycles of divergent and convergent thinking surrounded by the open sharing of experience so that we can drive the right standards that serve us rather than us serving the standards. One of the most, thing, most dangerous things that we can do today and I think we're doing it far too often, is predictive standards. Standards that are based upon marketing desire and control as opposed to proven success and best practice. We need to make sure that in this transformation time, in these turbulent times, we allow for divergent thinking and new innovation and then go through convergent cycles. We need to put, make sure that we've got systems thinking and engineering first and foremost in systems engineering so that we're focused on delivering that value to the customer. We also, in the process, need to avoid Conway's law. Conway's law suggests that organizations which design systems are really constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. Systems thinking, systems engineering help organizations avoid the pitfalls of Conway's law. They ensure that system designs are appropriate to the problem being addressed. If you look at one of the earliest books on systems engineering, Management of Systems Engineering, uh, published by Wiley and Sons, it talks about three simple criteria that drive such organizations, facilitating communication, streamlining controls, simplifying paperwork. The bottom line here is there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all approach that works. It doesn't work for defining processes. And so organizations need to continuously document, define, measure, analyze, assess, compare, and change processes to best meet the goals for a project. We need to tailor. We need to tailor to the correct amount so that we deliver that value. If it's all about value, it's all about lean, we're trying to deliver the capability that the customer needs. So build on our foundation, learn from lean, draw from agile, transform our practice through model-based. And now one more, the systems engineer as leader. We have a critical role going forward, in my opinion, and a couple cautionary tales first. How about a system incident, how about the first of the 787 Dreamliner incidents? An entire class of planes that was grounded because of overheating problems in a battery. If you look at it, it truly was a systems challenge, a systems problem. The result, you can argue that it's a brand damage. How does this affect Boeing and the 787 as they compete with other manufacturers? That's a commercial example. How about a one that resulted in a degree of a national catastrophe? Fukushima nuclear facility. To quote the lessons of Apollo 1, this was truly a failure of imagination. No one thought through the possibility that placing the backup generators in the basement could result in flooding of those generators. If we'd imagined it, we clearly wouldn't have done it. We would have put those generators on the roof or done anything else to ensure that they could not flood. No one thought through the possibility. So from a systems perspective, we failed. 
how about from a biologic or an ecologic perspective, uh, invasive species? I, I don't think there's a nation on Earth that this hasn't touched in some way in this day and age. Uh, pictured here, you've got the European rabbit that was imported to Australia for hunting. It's now such a prolific breeder that it destroys land. Bring the red fox in for hunting. It's an elusive predator that uh, you know kills native livestock and animals. Sorry, native animals and livestock. How about bringing in one biological species to take care of another? The cane toads brought in to control the cane beetle. Well, again, prolific breeders that are toxic to native animals. What do we do as systems engineers to help us avoid these problems? Well, I think we're responsible for leadership. And there are multiple levels of leadership. You can argue that we need to lead from the front or we, we can lead from behind. And it's situational dependent. But the bottom line is sometimes that we need to lead customers. Sometimes we need to lead the C-suite, the C-level, the CEO, the COO, the CFO. How do we do that? Remember that as systems engineers, we have a perspective that is unique to us. It's not more valuable, but it's a perspective that is trained out of most people. Again, Western education teaches most of us to think in a decompositional way to break problems down. We need to help drive better solutions through the holistic picture. We need to elevate that with our customers with the C-level. We need to highlight the risk of unintended consequences. What happens as a consequence of bringing a new species in? But don't apply scare tactics in the process. Unintended consequences, people operate more out of fear than out of opportunity. We need to recognize that. That's a lesson well known from the practice of sales and business development. But crossing over to scare tactics and fear mongering is destructive and manipulative. Another lesson to borrow from our sales colleagues is to move the conversation from price and cost to value and return on investment. The cheap solution that won't last, the cheap solution that's going to throw up unintended consequences is not nearly as good as the slightly more expensive solution that delivers greater value. If we can talk about return on investment, if we can change the time horizon that our customers and our C-level look at, we can enable the systems perspective and we can enable better solutions. And in the process, we need to kill the old maxim of we don't have time to do it right, but we certainly have time to do it over. Uh, we can't afford that anymore. If we have to do it quickly, if we have to do it efficiently, if we have to do it inexpensively, we can't do it multiple times. A few more. Again, systems engineering is about connection and integration. Systems engineers need to connect and integrate. We need to bring together individuals, organizations, and technologies to solve these problems. We need to be at the heart of that communications hub. We need to champion this perspective, this systems perspective at every turn. No one else will. Take the systems view of problems. Look beyond the symptoms to the true underlying challenge. Look for the greater systems perspective in capabilities and systems. What are we trying to do? Bring it to portfolio management and emerging practice. Bring it across the enterprise. In doing so, particularly in difficult times, in tough times, in turbulent times, we need to take a page from the recent book by Dan Pink, To Sell as Human. And we need to sell through attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Attunement is packaging our message for our audience. I can communicate differently with an engineer. I can communicate differently with a systems engineer than I can communicate with the general public. Package our messages at a level and context that is appropriate for the group that we're talking to. That's attunement. Buoyancy has to do with being uplifting. People naturally affiliate and look for people who are offering uplifting messages. Again, this isn't an attempt to be misleading. It is simply recognition of the psychology. Be buoyant, particularly in difficult times. Clarity, 
it's speaking clearly. And there's a lesson from a communication that we can't forget. We need to communicate what the individual wants to know and needs to know and really focus on that subset versus the curse of the engineer, which is communicating everything that we know. We too often over talk. And then again, during these difficult times, systems engineers can serve as a personal model for adaptability, agility, and resilience. When those times are tough, when those budgets are cut, when those changing requirements come in, who does the team look to and who do they respond to? The individual who complains that the world is unjust, that this is not possible, that we're not going to be able to do it, or the individual who acknowledges the situation and says, hey, times are tough, but I think we can get this done and this is how we do it. If we can be adaptable, if we can be agile, if we can be resilient in our own practice as well as our systems, I think we can lead. We can lead from behind or we can lead from the front. So for me, these are six good steps for systems engineering in turbulent times. Build on our foundation, embrace the lessons from Lean, incorporate the insights of Agile, transform our practice through MBSC, begin with the end in mind. We're trying to deliver the value for the, the customer through the system of interest, not serve our own process. And the system engineer is a leader. What's old is new again. Perhaps it's not so much about systems engineering as it is about the systems engineer. If you look when times are good, there's a saying that even a turkey can fly in a tornado. In other words, lift is deceptive. We often do our best work in difficult circumstances. We put a man on the moon in nine years, in eight years, because we were challenged to do so. We have to be resilient, adaptable, agile. We need to champion hope and a positive perspective in these turbulent times. And, do a, and we do so through good practices with a renewed focus on value and perception. For me, it's a challenging time to be a systems engineer. We're living through the transformation of our practice. Pressures on our discipline are coming in the form of shrinking schedules and budgets. And we're asked to solve ever more challenging problems. But for me, it's a rewarding time to be a systems engineer. It's a great time to take on this noble profession because we're living through the transformation of our practice. It's a unique time in our, in our life cycle. The pressures on our discipline in the form of shrinking schedules and budgets are asking us to do more with less. A wonderful opportunity. And we're being asked to solve ever more challenging problems. It's never dull. It's never boring. Ultimately, the great challenges of our time are systems challenges. It's clean energy, it's transportation, it's sufficient food, it's clean water, it's ever more domains, it's resource allocation. These aren't necessarily systems engineering problems, but they are systems problems. And for me, the systems engineer is a linchpin going forward, whether we want that role or not. I hope we'll embrace that challenge. I hope we'll embrace all the responsibility and all the opportunity that goes with this. The flip side of challenge is always opportunity. For me, this is our age and our chance to make a difference as individuals and as a profession. And so I'd like to make this the age of the systems engineer and triumph in these turbulent times. So with that, you know, thank you for the time and, and I'm going to turn it over for questions. All right. Thank you, David. That was that was a very, very interesting um, presentation. Um, we do have some questions from the audience, so let's get started. Our first question is from John. He asks, can you elaborate a bit more on the Agile Systems Engineering concept? Okay. Great question, John. And one of the things that you have to be careful about when you talk about Agile Systems Engineering is simply where you put the, the separator, because there are two concepts. There's the engineering of agile systems, which is very important in this day and age. And there is the application of agile to systems engineering. Uh, given the context of the, the presentation and uh, in the conversation to date, we'll focus on the latter, which is the application of agile to systems engineering. One comment that I'll make, 
is agile as practiced in software engineering often is misapplied and we forget a key step. It's called print, sprint zero or sprint one, and that is the establishment of the fundamental architecture. Agile sometimes is mispracticed as just individual sprints delivering new capability and you add it on. There is an initial stage, which is the development of this overall architecture, and that is very much in harmony with the practice of systems engineering. So if we will remember that, the analogy I like to use is much like a painting. If I will lay out an overall roadmap, at a very high level. And then I will bring individual pieces of that painting from ambiguity or pure blank canvas into focus, I can end up with a true work of art. If I don't have that overall architecture or vision when I start, and I just work those individual aspects of the canvas, I might end up with a Picasso painting, which is wonderful art, but I don't want to fly in it. So. Agile, I think, has true applicability to our profession if it's practiced correctly. Now, we can't apply it the same way as software because bending metal is different than writing and changing out code. But if we will lay out that top-level architecture and then bring new aspects of that solution architecture into being, into focus, one by one, we can bring a greater system capability together. That's my view of Agile SE. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Daniel. He would like for you to share any advice on how we can prevent waterfall contract models of large projects or programs. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great question. When I talk about friction and the application and the uh, evolution to model-based systems engineering, one of the things that I often speak of is the contractual boundary and the problems that uh, contractual boundary has upon our profession. This aspect is one of them. We don't necessarily control the gates and the gating that is set up to apply to a waterfall system can be an inhibitor. The reality is right now there's not much control we have as individuals in changing a procurement model or a overall uh, you know, life cycle model. That is beyond our sphere of individual control. It's beyond our sphere of control on an individual project. What we can do on smaller projects is educate the customer and find success points within their community. Uh, Nobody wants to be the first pilot, but once one pilot is shown, oftentimes will be the second or third or the fourth. That's one thing that we can do. The other thing, quite honestly, is organizations such as INCOSI need to work beyond the systems engineering boundaries to help educate and transform the greater environment that surrounds the deployment, the development of systems. So this is a challenge that the profession at a grand scale has to embrace. The reality is today you have to live within the boundaries. And sometimes you, you morph your process to ensure that you have the deliverables that satisfy it. I wish I could give you a better answer than that, Daniel. Uh, certain things are beyond your scope of control in a project. This is likely one of them. All right, um, our next question comes from Julia. She says, does Agile and your strata methodology fit together? If so, how? Agile and Vitex strata methodology, in my mind, certainly do. Uh, they are variants of one another, and let me explain. For those who aren't familiar with what's called the strata methodology, uh, it's Vitex approach to effectively do systems engineering in layer. So rather than waterfall, where you would do requirements to completion, and then behavior, and then architecture and BNB, it takes a layered approach to the problem. At each layer, you're developing a complete model, requirements, behavior, architecture, BNB, and proving that it works before you move down to the next level, the next level, the next level. 
so at each level you have a working systems model and you stop you stop engineering when you either run out of time money or you've got the engineering to a detailed level a detailed enough level you can hand it off so that's context for those who aren't aware of Vitex methodology how does that overlap or uh, or align with agile well there's a variant here agile defines the same first step which says put together a top level solution architecture which will work it's not detailed at any level but it is the framework which we will plug pieces into and know that they will integrate and deliver us the solution so the top level solution of agile and the top level solution of strata vitex approach are the same the difference then in agile is it doesn't attempt to do the entire systems approach sorry it doesn't attempt to do the entire system at each level moving forward instead it probably focuses on subsystems in most application so you're still going to take a layered approach but you're going to take a layered approach to individual subsystems bring them into being plug them into this overall framework and when you have Subsystem A complete, you'll move forward with subsystem B, subsystem C, or capability one, capability two, capability three. Both of the methodologies, both of the approaches are dependent upon having a top level holistic solution that will work, is proven to work, and then you take it to lower and lower level of detail on the strata side, or you bring specific capabilities or components into being on the agile side so get the whole picture up front and then plug into it that's the similarities between the two okay thank you David our next question is from Lauren she says David in your opinion what industry is currently seeking the greatest growth in systems engineering the greatest growth that's uh, a great question um, one of the challenges of systems engineering, I will say, is there are many people, there are many domains that practice our principles, but they use completely different language. Okay, so uh, it's sometimes very hard to to pull them out. And I will also say that people apply these principles for different reasons. In some cases, it's management of complexity. In other cases, it's compliance what I would probably personally point to is the medical industry specifically the medical device industry but you can expand that to the greater biomedical and health industry I think that's the area of greatest immediate growth uh, you can also look to energy you can also look to transportation all three are areas that are growing rapidly in the application of systems concepts but for me number one most dynamic is probably biomedical devices. Okay, our next question is from Bob. Is systems engineering an area that program managers are involved in? Should systems engineering be percolating up to the program management area? A great question, Bob. And going back to the reason that PMI and NCOSI both participated jointly in that lean study, is that we realize one of the criteria one of the enablers for program success is better understanding and better uh, harmony in the practice of product man sorry project management and systems engineering so under a classic model for complex projects you would have the program manager project manager who's responsible for the budget and schedule and you would have the chief systems engineer who's responsible for the technical measures. The reality is, if you have both of those players on a project, each of them needs to understand the principles that are driving the other because cost, schedule, and technical capability are all interrelated. If you have one individual that's leading the project, they need to understand both principle sets. So this is truly one where we can better serve our customers 
if we will understand both sides of the equation, if we will educate ourselves in both sides of the equation, and uh, and hopefully improve the harmony b between both sides of the equation. And COSI and PMI have uh, have collaborations to do just that. Okay, I have another one here from Daniel, and it's part comment, part question. It's a little bit longer. The systems engineer as a leader, how about evaluating the role of systems engineer in the context of creating valuable solutions? For example, in practice, how do we relate to everyone else involved? Comment from Suja is to look at it from a perspective of sustainability in terms of environment, society, marketplace, and workplace. That's a that's a great comment observation uh, kind of question combination. So it's always dangerous when you draw a a systems engineer on any chart. We most frequently draw the systems engineer in the middle. Not that they're the most important, but truly that they are the hub of communication. Uh, you know, again, what different what differentiates the systems perspective and systems engineering? It's integration. One of the things that should differentiate the systems engineer on a project is serving that integration function across the team, and we do that by communication. That's why we frequently draw the systems engineer at the middle. Not that they're the most powerful, we never draw them at the top, but that they, op that they operate as this communication hub. Uh, they try to translate principles from one group to another. Remember. The systems engineer is talking from user to customer to program manager to domain specialist. Everybody has their own domain, their own language, their own set of concerns, their own principles. Systems engineers, at some degree, are generalists, so that they can understand those different pieces in the context of the specific problem. They can communicate and share the appropriate perspectives across this team. They can communicate up to the customer, up to the leadership, et cetera. So that's, I think that's more of an added comment to Suja's comment. If you talk about systems engineers as leaders, as I said, there are multiple leadership styles. There are multiple leadership roles. We don't have to lead from the front. We don't have to lead from a position of power. We can lead from the back. We can run along with the team as long as we champion this critical perspective and we keep in mind certain leadership skills. Uh, by the way, for those who are looking for those skills, Zane Scott, a uh, colleague here at Vitech, is running a wonderful webinar series through Encosi uh, that's available to all Encosi members that are available on demand uh, that talk about those skills that we as systems engineers should master in order to be better leaders at any level, leading from the front, leading from behind, leading from peers, communication skills, conflict skills, uh, decision skills, etc. So one of the things that I would point people to if you're interested in that domain is that webinar series available through Cozy from Zane. Actually, I wanted to add to that, David, that uh, Zane also did a blog series for Vitech, and it can be found on uh, our community site at community.vitechcorp.com. And I will be uh, chatting out that link to you shortly if you want to take a look at those. So our next question is from Ian. He says, you said that, that diagram-based engineering may be more dangerous than document-based engineering. Can you expand on that a bit more? Uh, great question, Ian, and thanks for, thanks for flagging that and calling it out for further clarification. Uh, first off, what is diagram-based engineering as opposed to model-based engineering or model-based systems engineering? When you're working with model-based systems engineering, in my opinion, there is truly an underlying model that you're dealing with. Now, the difference between us and mechanical engineering, for example, is our model is very, very difficult to visualize. Mechanical engineering at a most simplistic level, CAD, or, or sorry, the old engineering drawings, is front, side, top, take those three perspectives together, and it represents a unique uh, physical piece. When CAD was implemented, it wasn't a simple drawing tool. It wasn't a Visio file of front, a Visio file of side, and a Visio file of the top. 
it wasn't three separate diagrams, it wasn't three separate views, it was an underlying model. We need to observe the same in systems engineering. Now, the problem is we don't have that clear physical thing. We don't have a, uh, a physical model of a bridge that I can put on the table or a physical model of a, of a widget. We've got our models are ones and zeros. They represent requirements, behavior, architecture, VNB, the integration of all these things. If we fall into the trap of drawing individual diagrams and filing them away as separate Visio files, just to be simplistic, then all we're doing is drawing pictures. Those pictures are inconsistent. I guarantee they are. They're not achieving the true model foundation. A true model has rigor, has consistency, has completeness, has executability, all these, all these attributes. Why is that a trap? How do we get ourselves in trouble? Well, the only way or the most common way we as systems engineers know to look at model-based systems engineering is through diagrams. We view that underlying model maybe as an activity diagram, maybe as a sequence diagram, maybe as an n squared, maybe as a requirements diagram, maybe an internal block diagram. So we see our models through all these different diagrams but we are looking at a different view, a different perspective of a common underlying model. The reason diagram-based systems engineering is perhaps more dangerous than document-based systems engineering is we mislead ourselves. You can think that there's a model behind the scenes that is giving you the model integrity, that is giving you consistency, that is giving you completeness, when in fact, all you're doing is looking at a picture. That's the trap. And right now, one of the things when you, when you study transformation of disciplines and you, you study a transformation to model base, you can look to mechanical, you can look, look to electronic. It's a generational change. It's not quick. Right now, we are still in the early phases of that change of our, of our uh, practice, of our profession. And as a result, we don't often define our terms. We don't often clarify, are we using model in the same way they mean model? Are we hearing what they mean? And so kind of my caution to us as systems engineers is it's a little bit of a buyer beware world. You've got to understand what concept that you're trying to bring. If you wish to implement model based, what are you doing? What value are you seeking? What's your implementation technology? Uh, because people will use the same words and mean completely different things. Ian, I hope that helps. If you have additional questions, I'll be happy to answer them here or offline, but that's a kind of a little soapbox view from David on model-based versus diagram-based. <laughs> All right. Um, I have one more question from Lauren. She asks, how does an industry measure in metrics the effectiveness of systems engineering? <laughs> oh, the magic question, Lauren, and, and that's a great question. I was on a telecon earlier today where somebody was, was talking about the challenge of the value of systems engineering. Uh, if you want to talk about the value of, uh, of ASIC design, you can look at the fact that you've not, you've, you used to have a board and now you have it on chip and you can produce it faster and cheaper and less power. How do you do the same thing with systems engineering? And so often, the, co the value of systems engineering only shows up in the problems that don't occur, okay? So basically, how do you prove the value of an error that's never realized? That's pretty hard to do. You can't do it on a given project um, because if you apply great systems engineering principles and you don't have problems at integration and test, you can't define the money that you saved. The best way that we have right now is through studies. And Joe Elm uh, at the Software Engineering Institute, earlier, let's see, was it earlier this year? It may have been earlier this year, it may have been late last year, published a wonderful study across industry on the value of systems engineering, the ROI of systems engineering. And again, we can get you that link. It is through studies like that that we can prove the cost of not doing systems engineering and conversely 
the value of doing it. Uh, it is a statistically complete study. It can show the application of best practices, how that manifests itself. I wish, like other professions, we could point to the reduction from a board to a chip and say, look, isn't it cheaper to produce? But systems engineering is largely about bringing into being unprecedented systems. And on an individual system basis, the best that we can do is say, hey, that went smoothly. We stayed on budget. We stayed on schedule. Um, now, on a product line family, if you're developing a, a family of UAVs or you're developing a family of medical devices or a family of printers, then you can point to the value of product line architectures and the reuse and replication, et cetera. But more often than not, we're being asked to answer the question in the generic, you know, if I apply systems engineering to this project, what will it save me? That's pretty hard to do. What we can do is point to the studies that say, if you don't, here's a benchmark study that says you're going to run into a heap of trouble in cost and schedule and quality. Hope that helps. I, I wish I had something a little bit better, but that study from Joe Elm and Software Engineering Institute is a very good one. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. That wraps up the Q&A for today. And I apologize to our audience if I didn't get to your question. We ran a little bit over today. Um, if you think of any other questions or comments that you didn't get a chance to send in, we invite you to post those on the form of our community site at community.vitechcorp.com. And I chatted out that link to you a minute ago, so you can find that in your chat window. As I mentioned before, a recording of today's webinar will be posted in the resources section of our website within 24 hours. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and invite, I invite you to join us again for our next webinar entitled Core's Integrated Toolbox Delivering SysML with Integrity and Efficiency by Ron Kratsky. And I'm going to chat out a link to you now uh, that will take you directly to the registration page. Also at the, at the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in the future. We have added some new questions to help us determine the best time to hold our live webinars, so please let us know what works best for you. So that's all for today. Once again, thank you very much for joining us and have a terrific day.